Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 6. This is the Professional Diploma in Procurement and Supply and this is Module 9, Supply Network Design. Learning Outcome 1, which is to understand the strategic nature and influence of supply network design. So supply networks with more connections can obtain multiple levels and have higher levels of complexity in their structure, which you can see by the diagram on this slide. A business com comprise a, a network rather than a sort of linear relationship. There are three essential structural dimensions in supply networks used for describing, analyzing, and managing supply chains. We have the horizontal, the vertical, the horizontal position of the focal organizations, and the dimensions of a supply network include things like the types and complexity of the products or services, the number of available suppliers, the raw materials that you'll need, the number of logistical routes, and the geographical distance to buyers and demand locations. And as the number of suppliers and buyers in this network increases, supply chain managers in all organisations should understand how many chains need to be managed and controlled. This is where a supply network design is needed. And that supply network design is a practice of allocating resources within supply chains. Now, supply network designs consider locating facilities determining the capabilities and capacity of those facilities, as well as the source and demand, and then selecting the right mode of transport to minimize the cost. And you've got to remember here that, you know, organizations are going to focus on supply development to solve problems with suppliers. They want to create stability in supply chains and in a, a sort of culture of continuous improvement. So the purpose of supply development is to add value to the supply chain by designing that optimal supply network. Now a network is a system where there are interconnections between individual units. The individual unit is a network that can be humans, businesses or other types of social groups. Now, networks can be identified as different types depending on whether the unit in the system is symmetric, asymmetric, or centralized. So, a symmetric network ties between supply chain partners and they're valued and undirected. The supply relationship requires mutual confirmation. The asymmetric network, there is presumed directionality within the relationship, which does prevent a symmetric tieback. So the relationship here is one sided. And then a centralized, which is a supply network relationship based on centralized authority and responsible for decision making. But regardless of these types of systems, next networks can be classified according to three main types, you've got social networks, bureaucratic networks and proprietary networks, both hard and soft. A social network is formed of sharing information and materials between people or industry districts where there is a shared interest. So for example, an informal group of professionals in a particular region. These sorts of networks have no clear boundaries and each individual unit may have its own independent objectives, but the units can cooperate to achieve the same objective by developing contacts with one another. The bureaucratic network has its own horizontal or vertical structure. So there could be members of a committee tasked with a specific objective. It focuses on complex institutions and it aims to accomplish specific objectives. It's different from a social network because inside the bureaucratic network, individual units are formalized and associated in centralized agreements. So examples of bureaucratic networks are trade associations or industrial networks. And then we've got the proprietary network, privately owned and a controlled group. The units involved in this network have specific isolated objectives, which are gonna be different from the object objectives of others outside that network. 
So inside a proprietary network, all parties involved hold, hold property rights and equities. A joint venture is an example of a proprietary network. Now, the classification of these networks can sometimes be a bit unclear. So a broad determination of a supply network could include elements of bureaucratic network and proprietary network. In fact, there is another often easier way to distinguish between networks in a commercial environment based on the cooperation between the two organisations. They can be classified as hard or soft. A hard network is where all organisations are forced to cooperate in production, marketing, resource management and other activities. Whereas a softer network is where they come together to solve problems, share technology, information and def defend themselves against the same competitors. When more connections are involved, supply networks can obtain multiple levels. Now, the concept of supply chains is constantly changing because of the rapid changes in technology and business environments. And generally, a supply chain can be defined as the process that starts with acquiring raw materials from suppliers and ends with delivering finished products to its customers. So for an example of a, a supply chain for a bottled water might be you've got the still water supplier who passes that to the bottling plant that then goes to a distribution center nationally and then potentially regionally and it ends up in the supermarkets, the shops or the vending machines. So if we stick with the bottled water supply chain, um, we'll still see that, you know, outside of the main supply chain, you know, plastic suppliers provide the raw materials for the bottles and the labels and logistics companies provide warehousing and transport and repackaging. So there are lots of obviously different informations and different parts that are fly, flowing backwards and forwards. This one on here is looking at an apple juice um, organisation that's buying apples from the farm and, and putting it through the plant, the distribution centres and then into the supermarkets. But there are other parties that, uh, that get involved in that supply chain network. Now, the location of operations need to include infrastructure of its supply networks. That's going to include suppliers, manufacturing plants, warehouses, distribution centres and so on. So to reduce the customer waiting time for their finished products, most organisations will improve their network by connecting raw material suppliers, setting up new assembly lines, moving their warehouses, location analysis, which helps supply chain practitioners to find an optimal location that's close to their suppliers and their markets. But it should also consider budget limitations. Many tools can be applied to help perform a location analysis. So for example, a bit of proprietary analysis, site selection mapping, and information from multiple databases. Once potential sites have been identified, they can be rated against relevant weighted criteria, like the, the, lo the local labor wage or the distance to suppliers, the community involvement, the distance to customers and all the transportation modes. The site with the highest weighted score is likely to be the optimal location. Good supply network designs should improve the performance of companies on their suppliers. So from one point to the other, I mean, we've got here looking at stable relationships with suppliers, reducing the cost of logistics, better comms, shorter lead times, lower inventory volumes and faster fulfillment of market demands. But what influence does capacity and resources have on that supply network? An effective supply chain management process is one that plans effectively in order to match the level of output with the demand of that output. 
Each supply chain within the supply network faces uncertain demand from the market. And this demand is even more unpredictable in a network with multiple levels of suppliers, manufacturers, logistics providers, and retailers. So the diagram on the left is something known as the ball whip effect. This is where you get increasing fluctuations in inventory due to changing customer demand. Irregularity in ordering in the lower part of the supply chain can manifest as larger variances higher up the supply chain. So this phenomenon known as the built ball whip effect or the Forrester effect is not a wise behavior. The consequences are excess inventory and costly management. In addition, an excess in capacity may cause resources to be wasted and there is no accompanying increase in the customer demand. Now, there are some possible influences to be created by holding the right level of inventory, and I'm not talking about excessive inventory, just the right level of inventory. Clearly, you know, some of the negative effects of overstocking is that your cost will increase, the quality of the product could deteriorate, and the flexibility might be quite difficult. But a high fill rate can have an effect of holding a large amount of inventory, guaranteeing that organizations provide the products when their customers want them, rather than the customers having to wait. This increases customer service levels. Shortage avoidances, you know, some products with a long replenishment period might be beneficial to hold larger inventories because it can guarantee that the organization reduces its risk of running out of stock. And then the pricing benefits for a supply chain where the predictable demand exists, organizations can be confident in keeping larger levels of inventory. So, you know, you've got to think about the fact that a customer demand is difficult to forecast in some industries. So businesses keep an element of safety stock based on historical sales information. And these safety stocks guarantee to have sufficient capacity to fill regular shortage demand. But the lead time is a key factor here in influencing the amount of safety stock in a supply chain because it's the amount of time it will take to replenish the stock. And if that's a month, because it's coming from the Far East, for example, you will need to have a month's worth of um, buffer stock or safety stock. Now, from a commercial perspective, value is the extent to which a product or service is perceived to meet the customer's wants and needs, and it's measured by the amount the customer is willing to pay. So based on this definition, added value is generally defined as the difference between the selling price of a product and the cost of producing it, i.e. the raw materials. Now, obviously, the value of the product doesn't necessarily equal its added value. The value of a product is not determined only by the cost of production. It's determined by a customer's judgment and satisfaction. In short, value is defined by the end customer rather than a role within the supply chain. Now, before considering how to add value for customers, we need to think about how value can be defined in our supply networks. The objective of the supply chain is to link all the organizations so they work together in order to produce and deliver the right products or service to the right customer at the right time. And this can be described as the three W's, when, where, and who. And this is regarding creating value in the supply chain. If we use the three W's, we will have less capital and resources being used. And we want to avoid things that constitute waste. Now, customers will be better engaged when the business, if they're offered something of a sustainable value. They don't really care about how organizations improve management and production efficiency. The moment they feel their expenditure is gaining a greater appreciation is when the, is when the added value is identified and presented. So, in quantifying the value of one of its skills, it's necessary to maintain good customer service. 
especially in a competitive environment. And there are some competitive advantages to businesses through increased added value. The most significant advantage of adding value activity is something known as value creation. For example, an organisation can improve its quality targets, its customer service levels and communication skills in the process of adding value. But for SMEs, these improvements will enhance their management awareness by linking business value, customer value and profit together. So some key advantages of adding value, you might have receiving higher profits because customers are willing to pay more. Developing an understanding of our customers' expectations and demands because customers don't always know what they want and they're driven by good experiences sometimes, not necessarily the quality. Maintaining a competitive advantage, you know, because every business fights to survive in a competitive environment. So just check, does your competitor provide similar or identical products? If you can provide faster product development and delivery, this will add value to a customer and maintain their loyalty as well as your competitive advantage. And then delivering value benefits rather than lower prices. Disintermediation is the elimination of intermediaries in the supply network. And this is made possible by the creation and development of the internet. So what are the advantages of this? It promotes openness, transparency between customers and suppliers, can lead to more efficient transfer of information between them, as well as increasing the timeliness of information available to both parties, that's the supplier and the customers. The flow of materials of information is disintermediated in a supply network, and customers are classified as e-commerce or traditional customers. The dashed lines on the one on the right hand side is representing the information which includes orders, the amount of materials required and the available assembly lines, the number of trucks. This information is gathered on an information sharing system and is shared in real time. Now, e-commerce customers have a shorter route through the network rather than a traditional customer. From preparation to delivery, their products go through only three levels, suppliers, manufacturers and customers. Information sharing systems in e-commerce will enable the different levels of suppliers and manufacturers to start the preparation and set up when orders are placed by the customer. It saves time as raw materials can start to be produced or assembled once they arrive at the manufacturer's site, rather than having to wait for raw materials to be booked into the inventory when the assembly lines are set up. It also means that products can be delivered to the customer straight away, rather than being transported from the distributor and the retailer, which enables practitioners to share in the decision-making process. So here, what we're looking at here are the degrees of disintermediation and the internet-based technologies and business. So with the help of internet-based technology, any decisions can be classified as belonging to e-commerce, e-procurement or e-manufacturing. E-commerce is supporting the process of the selling, distribution and aggregation. E-procurement for sourcing, purchasing, allocation and fulfillment. And e-manufacturing, supporting demand, capacity and resource planning. But in reality, there are different degrees of adoption of internet-based technology. And the businesses themselves can be classified into four types. They're either traditional businesses, e-sellers, e-purchasers or e-integrators. Traditional businesses refer to organisations that rarely use internet-based technology. They've widely existed in networks up until early 2000s. The business operations were based on 
very traditional management methods and relied mainly on labour, raw material suppliers. You have the e-sellers. These companies are adopting internet-based technologies for sales and customer service. So they may be organisations that link upstream with downstream. These companies use significantly higher levels of internet-based technology than a traditional one, but they do not solely rely on the internet for procurement. So that's where the e-purchasers come into play. These companies adopt internet-based technology only for their procurement. So they used, they're using it to connect with the upstream. In comparison, with a large number of traditional businesses and e-sellers, e-purchases are a significantly larger group. And through the internet, it's easier than selling via the internet, especially if the operation of e-procurement could start on the internet without making large investments in other areas. And then you have the e-integrators. These are organizations that adopt the internet-based technology in all of their business operations, from external areas, including purchasing and sales, to the internal areas like daily business management. So they've got a variety of internet-based technologies that have been adopted throughout the supply chain. And this group of organizations is the smallest of the four because the full adoption of the internet requires heavy investment. So the new internet-based technology developed at rapid pace in each of these four types of businesses, but they'll also have very different degrees of disintermediation. Now, Porter's value chain that's illustrated here looks at the relationship between support activities and primary activities. The primary activities at the bottom and the support activities are at the top, and they're used in all organizations as an essential building block to create their own value chain. All business activities in support categories facilitate the primary activities. So, for example, HR is needed to allocate suitable employees for operating the business and procurement support operations. So the building blocks aim to help organisations maintain their competitiveness and add value, which will result in the margin achieved for organisations. So margin is the value creation and the value that's received. It's the overall cost of creating value. The more value that an organization creates, the more margin that will be received if the organization is able to control the investment on the value creation. The more value that can be offered to customers, the more competitive the organization will be. A value chain and a supply chain are both extensions of organizations. There are similarities, but also differences between them. The value chain is described from the perspective of business activities and a supply chain is described from the perspective of business functions. Now both aim to work together to create value for the organization and provide a product to the customer. In both chains, demand is generated from the customer and financial flows are transferred from customers to suppliers. A network can hold and maximize value, but it is difficult to achieve a maximum level of margin in the supply chain. A value net is a framework for connecting different but relevant organizations. Organizations exchange their, exchange their created value in order to generate specific value to the end customer. Now, all organizations involved will benefit from the exchange process. Value net can be visualized by mapping nodes and connectors. The nodes represent organizations and the connectors represent the relationship between those organizations. So there are two types of value nets. You've got internal value networks and external value networks. But four essential business players in a value chain will include the suppliers, the customers, competitors, and the complementers. 
So for example, software companies work with PC manufacturers to install the required software before the product is finalized. In this instance, the software company is a complementer for the PC manufacturer, but together the two businesses make customers value and the finished product more than the PC manufacturer has pr provided only with the hardware. Bovell and Martha identified five characteristics of a good value net. You need to be agile and scalable with flexible production, inventory management, distribution and information flows. It needs to be customer driven with customers demand triggering business activities in the value net. It needs to be fast flowing with fast order to delivery cycles. It needs to be collaborative and systematic with companies engaging in value creating relationships. And finally, digital, with digital technologies adopted in the management of the value net. Now to understand the players in the value net, an organization can create a diagram and this is all in order to identify its suppliers, its competitors, its complementers, and its customers. That's obviously the first step in developing a strategic supply network. But the next thing an organization should review is its current business strategy to check whether or not the strategy matches the roles and functions of the four players. And during this stage, you'll identify five elements which form the acronym PARTS, P-A-R-T-S which are the players, the added value, the rules, the tactics, and the scope. And in doing so, you can ask questions such as, who are the players? What is the added value? What are the rules in that value net? What tactics can be used to shape that business strategy? And what is the scope of that value net? So to identify who the players are, you need to think about who you can cooperate with and how to cooperate with them. For competitors, think about their strengths in the market. Why do they have those strengths? And for complementers, think about who you can join a partnership with. When it comes to the added value bit, look at the things that potentially can add value to the product or service. And you can do this by looking at the VRIO framework at the bottom. This stands for value rarity, inimitability and organization. And they're addressed in this order. So when adopting this framework, you need to address the following questions. So about when you come to sort of the value bit, you know, do you offer a product that adds value to the customer? Can the organization exploit an opportunity or neutralize a threat? And if the answers are no, the organization has a very weak position. If the answer is yes, then it's added value. The second thing is about rarity. Does the organization offer a resource that has some, something rare about it? Is it difficult for others in the market to find? If the answer is no, then again, you need to think about how you can incre increase the rarity of your product. But if it's yes, it means the products are valuable and rare. The imitability is asking yourself, is it difficult to imitate my products? And whether there would be significant cost disadvantages if others tried to obtain, develop or duplicate your products or services. Again, if the answer is no, but the products are valuable and rare, they can afford and easily copy. If the answer is yes, this means the products created by the organizations are valuable, rare and hard to imitate. And then the final one about organizations, you need to ask yourself whether or not you need to evaluate how well the organization organizations management systems and management structures are. How do you capture that value? The answer to this question is the, the organization should examine its management systems, its structure and culture and processes. 
And if the answer to this question is no, it means the organisation has weak internal management and support. It may find it difficult to create valuable, rare, hard to imitate and sustainable products. But if the answer is yes, it's already achieved the sustained competitive advantage and is able to provide added value to its customers. So coming back to parts, if we look at the letter R, we're now looking at the rules. This is in every business and industry, there are, the market has its own individual rules to guarantee it's run in a way that's correct and in the, in the right manner. It might be regulations, agreements, or even laws. From a tactics perspective, these are quite similar to strategies, but a little bit more concrete, maybe short-term and flexible. So they're activities of allocating and arranging. And when planning your tactics, you're focusing on achieving goals. All the material information like labor, capital, and other resources should be available. And tactics should sit in the center. And finally, when it comes to the scope, this can be defined as the boundaries of the business responsibilities and activities. Maybe your market share. Are you ready to establish the tactics of the market and the scope? And you should decide whether you can benefit from increasing your scope or whether increasing the scope can also benefit the markets. Now, the primary aim of almost all supply chains is to minimize the cost while maximizing service levels. In terms of efficiency and responsiveness, one of the main factors that plays a role is, to, is the decision, I suppose, in selecting a supplier. But this decision is going to be dependent on the, the strategy regarding your make or buy decision. So make or buy is a strategic decision of supply networks to determine whether or not it's required to be provided by an organization or an external supplier. The make decision, think, you, know, you, you need to think about factors such as the plant and supplier operations and the quality control, the management of the lead time, the transport and logistics. Now, more specifically, insourcing suppliers attempts to ensure that reliability and timely delivery of the materials from suppliers is done. But the buy decision is used more when the supply network suffers from a lack of insourcing skills and contains limited production facilities. One of the main goals of the supply chain is to improve quality of the product or service or achieve a better position in the marketplace. In this case, the decision to provide high quality raw materials is a focal significance. Now, the decision to insource or outsource can cover a number of areas, including transport, logistics, running parts of the manufacturing assembly process, or the provision of value-adding services. And whether the organisation chooses to perform these activities in-house or outsource is going to be determined by a number of factors. The first one being the competence. You know, do you have the necessary competence to effectively execute that supply chain activity? From a finance perspective, a comparison of the financial benefits of insourcing versus outsourcing will make that quite obvious. Cost variability, you know, when you think about outsourcing to convert fixed costs into variable costs, you have to manage supply and demand fluctuations. The scalability, you know, you might have a required flexibility and scalability of supply chain activities, and that could be things like seasonality, globalization, when moving into new markets, outsourcing may be preferable to gain access to a country specific or a geographical knowledge. And finally, the risk analysis. The risks of hitting key customer deadlines may determine whether or not the organization will insource or outsource its supply chain activities. We're now looking at different levels of integration. Um, we're going to start by looking at vertical integration. This decision to make or buy can result in vertical integration. So, you know, if it's something in microeconomics where a manufacturer acquires another business in the same industry, 
This could be at different stages of that supply chain. A typical example of this would be the strategy of the Ford Motor Company, which not only owned the manufacturing subsidiaries of Ford, but also possessed a shipping and rail fleet. He also then bought a tyre manufacturing plant in Brazil to guarantee the tyre supplies. But additionally, vertical integration is one of the supply chain management strategies that increases the degree of ownership in its own network. So the company tries to own some of its suppliers or distributors in its supply chain. So the forward vertical integration, the one at the bottom, is when a company takes control of its distribution centres, its retailers. So a food supplier owns the supermarket for selling the products, it employs a forward vertical integration strategy. But a backward one, the one at the top, is applied when the organisation controls its subsidiaries, such as its suppliers, anyone that provides materials or other inputs into the production. So for example, American Greetings is a company that produces greeting cards. If the company owns a paper company for its production, it will exhibit a backward vertical integration. And now applying this integration is very difficult for complex strategies for companies. It could be costly and complex. And in most cases, upstream producers integrate with the downstream di distributors to keep their product position in the market, which seems like a good strategy. But when demand decreases, a large number of companies face a significant price gap with the downstream distributors and can only try to keep the products at cost or break even point. Now, outsourcing. The cost efficiency is an important decision making component for an organisation who chooses to outsource some of its core activities. If an organisation faces a situation where their market dominance or market share is threatened by a new entrant, outsourcing offers an option to decrease the fixed cost and replace them with some variable costs. It refers to transferring some activities to an external organisation which has the appropriate expertise. Example being a manufacturing company tends to outsource the whole or part of its production to another plant. This might bring benefits, but also challenges in the supply chain. You could outsource things like transportation or distribution. So you can focus on the things your business is good at. But offshoring is a little bit different because this is the process of transferring in-house business functions and processes to another country. And that's in order to leverage cost reductions through relocating a business function or via selecting a, or something that's already in country supplier to perform that service. And that's been common practice for the last sort of 50 years as and that's the result of you know, development of globalization and the reduction of trade barriers. So it's quite similar to outsourcing in terms of its risks and benefits, but the key driver behind offshoring is the choice to move production to a lower cost country. Now in a supply network with multiple levels, it's more difficult to balance capacity and demand. And having different amounts of capacity upstream requires people to design their procurement strategies in order to fulfill market demands. And obviously demands with uncertain or, un or changeable forecasts is, is much more difficult to do that. So what's the optimum capacity? That's all about balancing demands and cap capacities. And you face three questions here. You know, how many products can we produce? How many does our customers want? Can we balance the production and demand of the customers without creating any extra cost? If you're going to answer these questions, you need to review your capacity plan, demand and forecasts. So manufacturing capacity is the maximum output that a business can produce in a given period of time with the available resources to them. That could be um, so many cars per day, so many cakes per minute, so many calls per hour.
Now, one method that can be adopted by the operations team to identify a solution to your manufacturing capacity problem is something called linear programming. This is a mathematical method that's used to find a maximum or minimum level of desired objectives. And that desired objective is constrained by some conditions. So it's able to consider a series of predefined constraints and achieve an optimal result with these constraints. But that optimal result may be a minimum or a maximum depending on how the problem is defined. And the options could include minimizing inventory level or maximizing the labor and machine working hours or firstly, minimizing the transport and production costs. So it's basically a mathematical modeling technique. And it's based on transferring business problems and describing management problems as a special linear relationship. The variable which can be understood as the influencing factor should have a direct impact on the result. And there are lots of benefits to this. You know, it's about you know, representing that problem mathematically makes it easier to find a solution. It determines the optimal one as well, the best option for the decision makers. You can do this in financial, marketing, HR, and it takes into consideration the limitations and conditions. It's flexible as well. But the downside is it is a very quantitative approach to problem solving in that it's very objective and measurable, but that might ignore some of the softer side, you know, the, the qualitative analysis that might be needed. And sometimes, you know, it's not realistic. Some of the things it comes up with, you've got like a short life product or something. Now, optimum capacity brings lots of benefits to organizations. So we've got large capacity advantages of being full but economic utilization of resources, the economic utilization of labor resources, or even full utilization of raw materials, bulk buying and selling. But the downside is inability to personalize or customer orders and possibly the negative effect it could have on the workforce. And competitive advantage focus on price rather than cost where added value can be added and it's less adaptable. But having small capacity, the advantages here is the nature of demand, the need for smaller levels of capital and the direct relationship between customers and its producers. Conversely, the downsides could lead to higher production costs material and resource wastages and difficulties in facing financial crisis. Cost of raw materials could increase, lack of new techniques and research, which will make it very difficult for you to compete with large capacity businesses on price. Now capacity in an organization is not always fixed. The operation team needs to determine the timing of the capacity change and whether or not that needs to increase or decrease. The reason for changing capacity is the conflict between an organization, its capacity strategy and its customer demand. And the conflict results in inefficiency, waste and resources, and, and ultimately a, a, a reduction in customer satisfaction. What's worse is that a dissatisfied customer will result in losses in terms of customers and business reputation. So capacity change can be classed in three levels of time, something short term, medium term or long term. The short term one, the time scales for this are from one day up to a maximum of three months. So with short term capacity planning, you've got flexible resources, you can accelerate the speed of change, like increasing the number of staff working for the workload. Medium term tends to be between three months and 18 months. And this one will allow you to design, revise, improve and innovate the changes. And lastly, the long term, which generally focuses on a more 18 months and beyond. And that will ensure all investments will be profitable. These tend to be slightly more complex and lengthy and result in non-reversible changes being made.
because it takes time to develop um, a longer term capacity strategy. Now, within an organization, capacity planning is defined as the process of determining the resources needed to meet that customer demand for the organization's product or services. This is determined by balancing two key dimensions. You've got the lead times and the economies of scale. And there are different strategies that can be deployed by an organization for capacity planning, such as a lead strategy, a lag strategy, incremental strategy, or inventory smoothing. With the lead strategy, this implies increasing an organization's capacity in anticipation of increasing demand for its products or services. It's quite an aggressive strategy because it aims to create new customers or keep existing customers away from the competitors. And that's by timely response to customers' needs when the competitor's capacity is not sufficient to meet their demands. It might be risky, you know, since the capacity plan is based on demand, it doesn't currently exist and it may lead to increased cost without any earning. So an example of this might be an Uber taxi. Uber sought to address com complaints about taxi firms where they were seen as expensive and offering low levels of service. So offering something like a ride sharing service circumvented the strict taxi licensing rules by classifying drivers as independent contractors so they could increase the number of cars for its service. But it also meant Uber were able to avoid employee costs that its competitors needed to manage. And working from a lower base, pricing was calculated using an algorithm that based the cost on the available rides in the vicinity. So you could you know, charge something that was competitive but flexible. Now the strategy was aggressive and was faced by a number of challenges from local authorities and drivers. The lag strategy is, is a more conservative approach than the lead strategy. What this strategy does is increases the capacity of an organization only if there is an actual increase in demand. It helps to make sure that an organization can gain a return on its investment by avoiding the creation of inefficient surplus capacity. But again, it could be risky because if you have a sudden increase in demand and you can't respond, you might lose not only the potential customers, but also your current customers might switch to a competitor. So an example of a lag strategy could be something in the fast moving consumer goods market, like a soft drink manufacturer. They increase their production as demand grows in response to a particular event like the weather changing. Now, increment, incremental strategy is where you increase the capacity incrementally instead of with a leap. So it means that organizations expand the capacity in small increments when it approaches full capacity. So a furniture factory might add 10 more employees to its assembly process when its capacity reaches 90%. And then finally, inventory smoothing. The main challenge in capacity planning is the uncertainty that exists in customer demand. It fluctuates over the planning horizon and makes the capacity decision tough and complex. And one of the most common ways to cope with this issue is to smooth the demand as much as possible. You know, most organizations do face cyclical fluctuations in demand, which cause many problems. So for example, an organization may have a reduction in service levels when the demand is high. And in this case, the customer demand cannot be satisfied quickly. So you have that risk of losing customers. But on the other hand, when customer demand diminishes, the organization faces underutilized resources, which means a less return on investment. So to avoid these consequences, you adjust the capacity according to the variations and you try to change the demand pattern to better match the available capacity. And this is known as demand smoothing. It's a tactic that an organization will use to temporarily reduce demand for its products or service during an over, overstrained production capacity. Our break-even analysis is the capacity used in capacity planning to identify the amount of sales required in order to break even. And the point at which the total revenue will equal the total cost and how much of a product or service an organization needs to sell in a certain period 
so they can cover the costs of doing business. So the key formula will look at the total cost, the total revenue, and the break-even point. And the formula for finding quantity at the break-even point has F being the fixed cost, C being the variable cost, and the Q is the quantities, P is the revenue from selling a product or unit. And that is the end of learning outcome one. Thank you very much for watching.